Today's episode is brought to you by Media for All, which was set up to help encourage more black, Asian and other ethnic talent into media and to provide a support and mentoring network to ensure talent flourishes in the media industry that we all love. If you're looking for a mentor or would like to mentor young ethnic talent, check them out at mediaforall.org.uk and it is all 100% free. Hello and welcome to the Shiny New Object podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. I'm the founder of Automated Creative, and this is a podcast about the future of marketing. Every week or so, I have the pleasure and the privilege of interviewing one of our industry's leaders, and this week is absolutely no different. I'm on a call with Mark Brown, who is Marketing Director, Northern Europe at General Mills. Mark, for those of the audience who don't know who you are and what you do, could you give us a brief overview of your career to date? Absolutely. And good good afternoon, Tom. So, uh, yeah, my name's Mark Brown. I'm Marketing Director for General Mills in Northern Europe. So that covers UK, Germany and Ireland as as we draw the map at General Mills. And I look after the marketing activation of uh, 15 brands um, across chilled, frozen and ambient categories, brands such as Aldo Paso, Hagendas, Nature Valley, 501 through to kid yogurt brands like Petit Flu and, and Froobs. Fantastic. And what were you doing before that? What's your path to taking on such a massive role? So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a food guy through, uh, through and through. So I've always worked um, in the food industry and predominantly in marketing. So before General Mills, I've, I've worked at Kraft Foods, worked at Kerry Foods. And I started my career at Weetabix. I started many years ago as a, as a territory sales representative uh, but then, but then quickly, obviously, obviously knew that I wanted to get into marketing, and um, and, and was fortunate enough to uh, to get my first marketing role at Weetabix. And and food really runs through my family. Um, my mother uh, was a baker, um, uh, uncle a butcher, grandma and granddad ran a cafe, and I've always been fascinated um, by food and have a great passion for food. And and um, and and with that, love brands as well. I always remember as a as a youngster, the, the favourite parts of watching TV were watching the adverts and not necessarily the programmes. I was always captivated by these great kind of short films um, that were in the middle of, of, of long, boring TV programmes that were often entertaining and funny and, and, and very memorable. So that's a, that's a potted history of, 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 I guess, why I'm doing um, marketing in, in, in food companies. It's from a, a kind of a long-standing... Uh, passion for food and and, and then a, and then a love for advertising and a, and a love for great work and then I've been lucky enough to work at some some really great global businesses uh, and at the same and and, and also at some very iconic kind of British uh, businesses as well. So I'd like to know if you're a marketing book reader or not and if you are a marketing book reader which of those books that you recommend most often and the ones that you've revisited over the years? Yeah, so so um, I do read. I, I find that, that generally the, the best way that I learn and, and, and develop is, is 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 reading books and then also um, just through osmosis and, and, and kind of on the job, if you like, experience. Um, there is one book that that I always certainly, as a, as I'm talking to to young marketeers, I always point them in the direction of this book, and I also think it's a good book for for people like me who, who've, who've been around a bit um, to, to, just to refresh and, and kind of re-engage with, with what marketing I think he's all about. And, and, and that book is a book called Where's the Sausage by David Taylor. Um, I, I worked with David Taylor a number of jobs ago. He has a brand consultancy called um, Brand Gym and, and, and he really helps brands um, kind of turbocharge their marketing plans and their marketing strategy and, and um, also his organization helps with it with um, innovation as well and what his book is all about where's the sausage is is, is effectively putting the substance behind the sizzle of marketing and of, and of brand management and I, and I really describe it to um, anyone that asked me that it's a real kind of brand management 101 I find it a real brand management 101 and the way David brings it alive isn't through a load of kind of theory it's through an actual story of, um, of, of, a, of, a, of a marketing team and, and, and how they go about kind of um, changing the, the, the path for, um, for their brand. So it's, uh, it's, it's that book that, that I always recommend to anyone that's um, 
and that's right at the start of the career in marketing. And it's that book that I go back to um, time and time again, just just um, when I find that that I need a bit more kind of guidance in terms of getting back to the basics. And what is the key lesson from that book that you'll never forget? I think um, it's... It, 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 it's kind of two things and, um, and, and and very simply it's around the sizzle is important is in is in the marketing sizzle and 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 the, and the creativity and, and, and the equity but everything's got to be geared towards selling more stuff in that as a as a as a marketeer my ultimate role is to sell more stuff and and, and there's a whole host of different ways of of getting there and and, and you know being consumer first building equity doing great creative work, all of that stuff is very important, but it all needs to lead to selling more stuff. So it's really great that you are recommending titles like that to people who are just starting their career. But I want you to think forward to the end of your career many years from now. How would you want people to remember it? Mm. So it's a great question. When I first got into marketing, as I said earlier on, um, what always fascinated me um, when I was a youngster was, was advertising. And, and um, I always found it you know, really entertaining and, and, and deeply engaging. And, and I, you know, I, I was always able to remember my favorite ads. And, um, and I'm sure everyone that, that works in marketing um, is, is, a, is the same as well. And, um, and that's really what what. I guess powered me earlier on in my career, and and you know if you were to ask me ten years ago what I want my career to to remember by, it, it was for doing great work, and I, I took a great sense of pride from from seeing my work in very public places, whether that be a packaging design I'd worked on, a piece of communication or creative, a, an actual product. Um, it, it would it would just give me a great sense of satisfaction to 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 see my work in a in a public in a public space and a, and a great sense of pride now as, as I've moved on in my career what I want to be remembered by and, and or how I want to be remembered by um, is is really being able to provide the environment to do that um, and I think that you know when, when all of our careers have finished and, and we're all heading into retirement I think the things that will that will stick in our minds won't necessarily be the great work that we've done um, and, and, and the actual tangible um, stuff that we've produced, but it'll be the people that we've worked with and the relationships that we formed and, and, and the impact that those people have in our lives. And I think certainly as, as, as I move on in, in, in my career now, I, I want to have an impact where people feel um, that, that they can create brave marketing, that they can do remarkable marketing and, and that they can take risks and, 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 and gamble. So, so, so now I'm much more about providing the environment. So, you know, if you were to ask me what I want my career to remember, to, to be remembered like, you know, in, in the next 10 to 20 years, it's about providing that environment to the people I work with to, to be brave and, and, and do some great work. And when you say great work, what do you mean? Do you mean work that you think is great from a creative perspective, or do you mean effectiveness, results-driven work? I, th I think I think all of that. I, I think you know. I, um, yeah, I said right at the start. Well, well, well um, when I was talking about about the book, it's, it's about selling more stuff. Um, but I equally acknowledge that sometimes um, work will be done that is just about brand fame or or, or, or about really kind of. Um, focusing on equity or, or, or engaging consumers at a particular time around a particular cultural moment. So I think I think great work can can cover kind of many different areas, and it, and it can be effective work. It can be work that really um, increases brand fame. It, it can be it can be work that that is very short term in terms of its impact, but but basically work that has an impact is is what's important. And, 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 and then whether that's on a whole host of kind of different measures, if you like, um, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in that. And so what are you doing to create that environment now? Yeah, I think the, the, the very simple thing I, I'm, I'm doing is, is really um, encouraging a culture of, of risk taking um, within the teams that, that I work with and, and, and quite simply trying to make them feel like I've got them covered and, and got their backs and that they have 
the support to make mistakes and take risks. And, and I think that that culture in itself um, will then al- allow people to, to do that. Um, we, we also have things at our organization where, where we encourage and reward um, marketing innovation. Um, as an example, we, um, we treat our budgets in, in a way that's, um, that, that allows um, our teams to invest behind marketing innovation as well in terms of um, just in terms of the way that, that, that we kind of um, ring fence, if you like, certain amounts of money that, that can only be spent on, on, on marketing innovation. So I think that there's a whole host of, of, of kind of softer, more, more cultural things that, 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 that is basically around um, allowing our people to, to, to take risks and, and, and to be brave. And then there's a whole host of kind of functional elements, if you like, where, where we carve out the, the resources to, to be able to do it as well. And, and then it's just, you know, about connecting our teams to, to people that can help them be, be brave or remarkable or, or, or do things differently. It, it's, and, and, um, and, and that's not people in, not just people in the marketing industry, but that could be people um, for, from a cultural perspective. It, it could be people from all kinds of walks of life. So it's, it's about creating the environment and then ensuring that, that the resources are there to do it as well. So before we move on to your shiny new object, I'm curious to know what is your best marketing tip? What is that silver bullet or golden nugget of marketing advice that you tell people a lot or you heard recently? Yeah, I think um, gen- generally speaking, the, for me, um, the best tip I give to people is, is that fundamentally marketing, I think, revolves around three kind of core areas building your brand um, with, with strong strategy and vision running your business and then and then finally leading and engaging um all your stakeholders and, and that's both kind of internal teams all the way through to to consumers customers a, 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 any kind of stakeholder and, a, and at a very simplistic level for me that's what marketing um is about and it's um it's it's something that previous manager told me but if, if you're building your brands running your business well and engaging your stakeholders then then you won't go far wrong and what to me that sounds quite quite complicated and a lot of work so how do you know where to put your time and your energy so i mean presumably you can't do those things all day every day or is that what you mean or is it a case of dividing your time equally across those things at different occasions or dialing up or down different elements of the three at different times could you just unpack that a little bit for me yeah of course I, I, and i think it is it's dialing it up and dialing it down um at, at various points in in time but but certainly um and ensuring that i think that as a as a as a marketer you um i think one is very much at the center or, or, or a marketer in, in a very consumer focused organization is, is very much front and center of um of that business and or, or it should be and i think doing all three of those things every day um is is not impossible and it'll be done in, in different ways and small ways like you might just have 10 minutes in the shower or whilst you're walking or, 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 or whilst you're doing something to think about, right, what, what direction is my brand going in? Is, is that direction still relevant? What's the strategy equally? You might just grab five minutes and, and, and talk to somebody in manufacturing or R&D just about your brand and, 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 and the vision and, and where it's going. So, so I, I don't necessarily see them as big, as, as big ticket items all the time. Um, but, it, but it's that, that kind of constant conversation that I think one should be having with themselves every day in terms of how do you um, improve what you're doing in, in each of those three areas. Um, and, and, and some days it'll be very small steps and uh, I think some days it'll be very big steps. This episode of the Shiny New Object podcast is brought to you in partnership with Madfest. 
Whether it's live in London or streamed online to the global marketing community, you can always expect a distinctive and daring blend of fast-paced content, startup innovation pitches, and unconventional entertainment from Madfest events. You'll find me causing trouble on stage, recording live versions of this podcast, and sharing a beer with the nicest and most influential people in marketing. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. So we're at the halfway stage of the podcast now, and we're going to talk about your shiny new object, which is boundaryless collaboration. We were debating whether boundaryless (laughs) was actually a word, but I think I know what it means. But can you explain to the audience what you see as boundaryless collaboration being? Yeah, of course. And and, um, I I think this is, again, another one of those... um, areas or, or 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 things that that has been accelerated in in the last you know nine to ten months for obvious reasons and 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 has been normalized as well in in, in terms of this this becomes a the kind of the, the new normal of of the way of working in um as we've gone through lockdowns um over the last um nine or ten months and pr- um principally i think what it's about is, is is just really opening up um collaboration and, and clearly virtual working and, and and virtual technology has allowed that in a in a much greater way but but what that is, is now allowed is is, is is that there's there's no more boundaries now in the world and um because of technology and because of the growing acceptance of um of virtual working and, and 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 the power of virtual working to um to get things done as as well as face to face and um and and I'll give you an example in, in that you could be you know in it uh, now in a virtual world you, you could be working on, on a creative project where where during the day you're coming up with the strategies and 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 the ideas and and and, re- and really thinking about the brief and and and, the, and what you want to do and then and then come kind of evening time in country x whatever country you're in you can then send that brief to a creative team in country y on uh, at the opposite side of the world and 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 get the creative worked on overnight so you've got something to respond to first thing in the morning when you're back at work and 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 i think that's always existed and and some some people have done it in, in 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 greater ways than others but i think this new acceptance of virtual working the technology and the new virtual world we've um, we've got into it has has really accelerated that it, it's also allowing um a lot more people as well to be involved in 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 kind of brainstorming ideation sessions development sessions where, where normally um if they were done face to face um there would be various um restrictions you know whether it be travel budgets whether it be number of people in the room or or whatever it might be and and, and, and we now find that that collaboration really opens up um, opens up the possibility of, of, of more people being involved, which I think is very important kind of for, for, from an osmosis perspective, certainly for people that are new to marketing. I think, I think they can get access now to, to a lot of these kind of meetings and sessions that, that, that normally they will be precluded from because their boss would go or someone else would go and, 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 and the cost of sending them there or, or the actual logistics of it just wouldn't make it possible. Um, so I, I think that's really really interesting and then for an organization like ours that, that that's a global organization it's um what it's allowing us to do is just bring more expertise um into into some of our sessions that 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 in a face-to-face environment we just wouldn't be able to do um, because you know it's obviously it's very difficult to, to ship people around the world just for a one or two hour meeting but now that everyone is virtual it makes it um, a lot easier to get a lot more varied expertise um in in one place um, at one time. So I just think that, that this whole kind of move to virtual and, 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 and a different way of working is, is really gonna lead to much, much stronger um, collaboration that, that, that really, I think, first of all, improves the quality of work because you can get more people working on it, more expertise working on it, but it's also gonna improve agility um, in, 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 in that you won't need to, wait um you know before things can be briefed or actioned or 
or, or kind of worked on, you um, you just send them to, to areas of the country that are, areas of the world, sorry, that um, that are starting their working day, and 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 um, and things can be worked on while whilst you're asleep. So, so um, I think that for me is um, is very exciting. We we, we had an example um, this is last week in 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 my own organisation where we were shooting a piece of creative in um, in Kiev. And um, and the technology we had was superb. Where, where my team could basically sit on their um, on their computer on their laptop and see the full full shoot just like they were there. And um, and 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 again, that, I think that's a great example. I mean, we we were able to take decisions in real time and and make and um, and make changes so, and suggestions. So just give me give me a, give me a bit more detail on that technology. So what? They they were just seeing every shot that came out of the camera, or were they sit get? Did they have like a three sixty view? Just give me. It, a it was it was a three sixty view of the set, so so it was a whole set. So so in that view, they could see what the camera on the set was seeing, so they could see what the director was seeing, but then they were getting to see the whole kind of set as well. So it wasn't it wasn't um, a live stream from the camera that was filming. It was a separate camera that 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 was kind of looking at the whole set. Um, so so just as if um, you were there. And so how did that work with the director? Did they have like a, a voice, did they have a Zoom call in his ear telling him to do stuff, or her to do stuff? How did that work? No, it was still, um, so, so it was a live um, speech link as well, but obviously um, my team weren't directing the director. The, the, there were still the creatives um, in the middle and then, and then it was still done in some kind of ordered, ordered way. Otherwise, I think the director may have lost the plot. Um, and so... I'm curious to hear you say that it's a move to digital. Do you think it's a, a move to digital or a move to remote or is it just a holiday from reality? How much of a, a swing back to normal or what, how it used to be? Do you think there will be and how much of this will be retained and, and, or, or will it all be forgotten about? Yeah, I think, I think inevitably there will be a swing Back. I, I think just by human nature alone, I think as as humans, I think we um, I think we thrive generally speaking off of kind of face to face contact and 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 collaboration and um, and being social. And I also think I, it does bring value in 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 some situations. But I think what what we've seen, you know, we we went into the, in into this lockdown with. Um, a real uncertainty as as to how you know business would work um, in, in in terms of a lot of businesses that were face to face, and and I think we've come through it seeing the potential for virtual. So I, th- I think there will be some natural swing back because because face to face is still good, right? It's, it's it's not a bad thing, but I think we will see more and more um, um, virtual working, and, and I think. There are certainly some things that are better suited to virtual working as well when everyone is virtual. Um, so I, I think inevitably there will be some swing back. Um, but I, th- I think a lot of the new behaviours that we've seen of the last nine, ten months will um, will stick because I, th- I think there's, there's, there's very good business reasons for them to stick. So what are the things in your working day that you don't want to see come back and what are the things that you do want to see stay? Yeah, I think um, very, very simply, you know, there were times um, in my working day where, when everyone is sat in the same meeting room um, and, and, and mainly being kind of presented at. Um, and and, and it's, it's things like that where I don't think we all need to be in the same meeting room now. I think that can be easily done um, um, virtually, um, so, so I think, and, and I think what that then brings, is, and what we've seen um, certainly in, in our organisation, it, it brings um, a greater clarity and focus to to those sessions, and 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 they become over the last nine ten months those those sessions have, have been have been much more streamlined and, and and more effective because I think in in a virtual world it. it, it I think the um, I think meetings can become sharper and, and, and more pointed um, because there aren't side conversations that are going on. Everyone's kind of focused on on, on the same thing. So, so certainly, 
you know, I, th- I think that's what I want to see um, to see stick um, is 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 one area. Um, I, I think another area is really to um, reappraise the role of officers um, in our in our working lives and. You know, should offices be the, the places where everyone just comes in, sits behind their desk and, and stares at their screen all day? Or should offices be be that place for collaboration, for celebration, for connection? Um, and, and, and then what does that mean for the, for the design of the office, the structure of the office, the layout of the office? Um, and, and then how do you ensure that, that in one's working week that they still have that time to, to be at the laptop and, and, and be at the screen and, 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 and to get kind of things done? Versus, you know, how, how do you um, carve out time for, for for that collaboration, for that celebration, for that connection? So I think, um, you know, it, it'd be great to see um, to see how organisations think about that in the future. You've maybe think that if you've got a large organisation in a big building spread over a few floors, in some ways, even if all all the staff are in the same building some people might be so far away that they're effectively remote working anyway <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I, you'll easily remember what it's how hard it is to get a meeting room yes yeah, yeah. and eventually yeah, inevitably you have like a weird stand-up meeting where you're sort of you know leaning on top of a photocopier or something and, and <laughs> you know is is that any harder than it is having a video call probably not yeah no absolutely and, and you know just one thing we've seen in in our office a lot so, uh, we're part of a, a global organization and, and there'd be people in meeting rooms with headsets on on a team on a team's call or, or, or a virtual call and, and again it, it just it, it just makes you think is, is that really the role for the office for somebody to be sat on their own on a headset looking at the, lap, at the laptop that they could be doing at home or anywhere else and, and not having to commute not having to you know spend time in traffic all the, all, all of those things um and you know, and 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 then even and and you're right. I've 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 on, on many occasions I've been in the office, in a meeting, sat at my desk with colleagues, a few desks away, sat in the same meeting because the meetings are virtual with with other people from um from around the world. So, so I think that there's quite a few examples of of that now that that you just look back on and think, my goodness, what were we doing? <laughs> I think the thing I look back on is in having a cold and going oh yeah no, I'll, I'll make it into the office and, you know you just go and spread that cold all over the train and you know all the rest of the country it's crazy isn't it yeah absolutely it, it, it does make you think it, you know i often think about um receptionists in, in, in doctor surgeries and, and just how um how how previously they would just you, you kind of go in and talk to them and be stood you know centimeters away from them and and um and it would be the done thing but i'm sure that coming out of this um, I think that would be very different, um, and I think you're right. You know, I think I think all all these kind of illnesses that that we've lived with, and, and viruses that we've lived with, and, and just carried on our normal life. I, th- I think that will be uh, questioned as well uh, moving forward. So, one thing I'm really curious about, and an indulgent question because it certainly affects my business. I'm curious to know how do you think pitching will change moving forward? So when I worked at an ad agency or a creative agency, because you are essentially pitching against a group of competitors, they probably weren't really that different. And some of the employees had probably worked for other companies in you know, sort of quite a homogenous way. Mm. The way that you made a point of difference was by your personalities, essentially mm. in the room. You know, you'd, if someone was like, can you jump on a train and come to Leatherhead and pitch to us? Yeah. And you do it and you know you, everyone would chip in that whole half day or whatever plus the preparation time and then i i assume brands would make a judgment call on the work but also how they felt about the people and you know all that kind of stuff mm. um and you did that because if if you were the agency you'd gone do you know what we're just going to dial in we're going to do a video call they, mm. they I, I think your win rate would have been pretty low so, yeah. so I assume you must have been on the receiving end of some creative pitches uh, in the last year on yeah. video calls. So I'm curious to know, firstly, are they as good as in-person pitches? And secondly, will you insist on in-person pitches moving forward? Yeah. Or, would, or would you mark someone down who didn't jump on the yeah. train and come to HQ? Mm. So um, answer to, to answer the questions, in, in, in um in a very brief way, yes and no. So, so yes, 
um, they have been good. And, 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 and no, we won't make organizations, um, agencies come and pitch to us face to face in the future. Um, so let, let me elaborate. Um, I think that for pitches to be successful in, 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 in this world of virtual working, I think, I think there's three things for me um, that are really, really important. And it's simple things. I think quality of the work and, 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 and good work still stands. So make sure that's front and centre, the, the actual work. I think, secondly, make the pitch pointed. Uh, I can't remember the, the amount of times I've been sat in a pitch face-to-face -face where, where the agency will spend the first 10 or 15 or 20 minutes telling me things I know, either about my business or about the brief I've given to them, um, all, all of that stuff. So, so, so I'd just say cut down the cut down the, the, the stuff that isn't, isn't essential and, and is not pointed towards the, the strategy or, or the creative execution on the inside or, or whatever it might be. So keep it pointed because I think in a virtual world, it is harder to keep people's attention um, and, and, and keeping it pointed and keeping it very straightforward is, is very important. And, and, then, and then the third point, and, and you spoke about it um, a little bit there, Tom, is, is around passion and, and find a way of, of getting that passion for the work or the brands that, that you're pitching on through. And, and, and that needs to be done in an inventive way. And what I'd also say is that a pitch for me isn't, it's not a one-off kind of presentation. A pitch is a process. And, I, and I'd say quite often um, a, a lot of the um, credibility, if you like, and a lot of the passion comes through from the contact you have with that agency outside of the pitch in terms of the conversations, the questions that are asked, um, and, 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 and just that, that, that general greasing of the wheels, if you like. So I, I, I suggest that certainly in this virtual world, don't wait for the pitch um, to be the first contact with a client after the brief. I think schedule lots of little informal calls and and um, and, and stoke the fire if you like. So, so those are the three areas that that I think are, are really important. And when I think about the businesses that have won pitches with our business this year, they've shown all of those three things. So so great work, um, very pointed, very clear kind of insight, strategy, execution, and then and, and then you've really displayed that passion in in obvious ways. You know, in, in terms of the costumes they were wearing during the pitch and and um, and and videos they've made but then also in between brief and pitch um regular contact asking asking loads of good questions showing loads of interest building relationships and uh, and, and and really working hard to to grease the wheels because it is harder when when one isn't face to face mark unfortunately we're gonna to have to leave it there if someone wanted to impress you in a LinkedIn message and get you to reply to them, what would be in that message? <laughs> Good question, and I and I and I get a lot of um, a lot of messages um, in, in LinkedIn, as, as I'm sure you can appreciate. I think um, first of all, just simple things like getting my name right, getting the brands I work on correct, um, and then being very very clear with how you think you could add value um, to me, my business, my team. So, so, so that, that kind of getting to that what's in it for me um, straight away. And, and, then I, and then I think second of all, um, showing a good, a, a good example of the work, a, a good example of work that really sums up your business. That's great advice. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks a lot, Tom. Hi, just before you go, I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the Shiny New Object Podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, or whatever it's called these days, or whichever podcast provider you use. We're an indie podcast, so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels. That would just be fantastic. If you haven't got time, that's also cool. And yeah, if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also, if possible, don't forget to subscribe. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, if you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions, anything, I'd be super interested to hear what you think. So please email me at tom at 
automatedcreative.net. That's T-O-M at, uh, I'm not going to bother spelling it. Anyway, you'll work it out. Thanks so much.